welcome to the Gilbert House Fellowship, a virtual gathering of believers seeking to better understand the Word of God, with your hosts, Derek and Sharon Gilbert, and Sam T. Doxon. Hello. This is on. <laughs> Honey, what are these things in front of us? <laughs> welcome to the Gilbert House Fellowship. People are going, what are they doing? We don't know what we're doing. That's the problem. Yes. We haven't sat at this desk for weeks. Six weeks. Sunday, October twentieth. Yeah, it was September eighth. Was our last uh, Gilbert House Fellowship, and we're back Who are you finally. Again? <laughs> this is why Tom Horn doesn't like to let us take vacations from Skywatch TV. We need retraining every time we come I back. I know from we do. So, well, we, we're glad you're here and you've stuck with us through these uh, this uh, period of intense travel. Yes. But uh, we are we are back. We've gone made it through the conference season, plus the one week there where I had to go to St. Louis for the annual Cubs Cardinals game with uh, been, outing with our daughter. Yeah, and that was incredible. That was a lot of fun. I'm so glad you do that because honestly, I know we just have the one child, but she's an imp- if we had ten children, you'd try to do this with every child. Yeah, so it would uh, be difficult to be here at all. With I know kids. you'd be gone every weekend. Yeah, but no, it was a lot of fun. Uh, we had a wonderful time at the conferences and. Some amazing fellowship and 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 spiritual warfare, right? Uh, boy, oh boy! Uh, there was some really wonderful. Just very, very quickly, in a nutshell, the uh, conference in Sanger, California, the little church there, pastored by Dr. Greg Crocker, uh, Cross Point Church, which is about fifteen minutes east of Fresno. Wonderful group and very hungry to hear about and learn about Bible prophecy. And so I was honored to be part of that group there with uh, Troy Anderson and Paul McGuire to uh, be there for the weekend. Spoke six times, which was a lot of fun. Mm. By the end of the sixth presentation, I was getting a little loopy, but it, it you know, th- praise God, it all but came together. But in itself was entertaining. <laughs> sure, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Um, but they are really spiritually alive and spiritually active. And that led to a divine appointment because a family from about uh, 30 minutes north of there who have four daughters, uh, two sets of twins who were frozen embryos that were, I hate to use the phrase left over, but that's essentially how they were, I guess, how they were viewed. Unused. Yeah. From a, uh, an in vitro fertilization treatment, so so it was not the Gillingham parents who froze these embryos. That's it correct. Was someone else. They someone adopted else. Them. They adopted them as frozen embryos, and Mrs. Gillingham carried them to term and gave birth. And they are musical prodigies. They play old fashioned gospel, bluegrass gospel, uh, western swing gospel, and some awesome a cappella harmonies. I showed their video to Tom Horn, and Tom is going to bring them to Branson to sing at the next, to perform at next year's Defender Conference. Oh, that's amazing, because they are really, really good. They, really good. Yes, incredible. Two sets of twins, ages 12 and 15, and uh, one of the 12-year-olds plays a stand-up bass. It's incredible. Oh, that takes some fingers. So, yeah, so the Gilly Girls will be part of the conference next year, and that was that came out of this uh uh, amongst other uh, things, just some incredible prayer and uh, prayer for revival. Paul McGuire had a vision of revival beginning in California. Uh, this was about seven years ago, July 4th of 2012. And between that and then the conference we just returned from last weekend in uh, Irvine, California, he he may have seen something. God he may, may have shown have. something. He, he and I actually have talked about that a little bit uh, in emails, and and it's similar to. And he even said this. It's similar to what I seem to have seen when we were over in Scotland. Yes, I kept seeing what what appeared to be like matches lit. Yes, and they started on the west coast of Scotland and then went all across it. And and he reached out to us after seeing you talk about that on the Jim Baker show and said that uh, he he had a strong feeling. Um, and he doesn't call himself a prophet. No, neither am a, I. It, sure, absolutely. That um, something was happening and that we're right in the middle of it for some reason. So pray that that is so. If God chooses to use us in that way, that's wonderful. If not, we'll just keep doing what we're doing. We're very we're happy do. doing what we're doing. That is true. That we is true. Are. So, uh, And then the San Antonio Conference, a lot of spiritual warfare taking place there with boy, um, a woman, as you were giving your presentation on the goddess Inanna, seeing a vision while she was watching of a bull charging you on stage, but then hitting an invisible barrier, like a glass wall between you and this bull and the bull continuing just to ram its head. Yeah, in. She could hear it striking. Yeah. And she wrote this down 
And then just as she had finished writing it down, you talked about Inanna and her epithets, the nicknames that were given to her by the ancient Sumerians and Mesopotamians, and one of them being the Bull of Heaven. Yes. And suddenly it clicked into place for her, and she was just stunned. But that was just one of the smaller things that happened that weekend. Yeah, so. also someone who was delivered, as I was yes. talking, uh, I was talking about Inanna, another epaulet uh, being the Queen of Heaven. Queen of Heaven. And uh, she, epithet, I mean, and she instantly started choking. She couldn't breathe. She couldn't do anything. She left the room to mm-hmm. try to find the restroom. And she met the Marzulis who were standing right at the door and they took her out and, and they did some deliverance with her. She coughed up a whole bunch of blood. Yeah, which you would and think then would, was fine. And that's the astonishing thing because you cough up blood and you think, okay, call 911 because yeah. that's not normal. No, no. And then she was fine. She was having voices in her head the whole time that she couldn't breathe. That's... Wow. Yeah, a lot so. of that was going on there. So we we are we've been we've been working. The Lord's been showing us a whole lot of interesting things, and and uh, who knows what's ahead for us. Well, but I am glad to get back to this because yes, honestly, we, Gilbert House Fellowship started us on this whole path. That's very true, and this is um, something that we've really missed getting into the Word and digging deeper because that's our you know well L. A. Marzulli calls it. This is the guidebook to the supernatural. So we really need to be in this because this is what gives us our instructions, our directions, our marching orders, um, encouragement, enlightenment. It's all right here. Amen. You know, speaking of encouragement, I just want to say this. When we were in uh, California and Irvine, uh, we had, of course, our book table set up and and we sell the books. um, You know, honestly, this isn't because we're trying to make a whole lot of money. We want to get the books into people's hands. And so we sell them for what we would normally charge. Mm -hmm. But, uh, um, we had a young man who came up and wanted to start the Red Wing Saga series. So his parents bought him book one. And, uh, you know, well, if you like this one, then we'll get the rest of them from the Skywatch TV store. The next day he came back and he said, I'm already on page 48. You like it then? And he beamed. He mm-hmm. said, yes, yes. So they bought some more. Mm-hmm. What's really interesting is seeing the number of men reading the Red Wing Saga and coming back. Because, you know, men and women, we've got different tastes. We're more visual. We like action, you know, rock 'em, sock 'em, you know, explosions and gunfire and car chases and stuff. And the Red Wing Saga has a lot of uh, dialogue. Mm-hmm. But that's a uh, a valuable way of teaching. And, and it also reveals a lot about the characters. And I think one thing men miss when we read a lot of stuff geared to men is character development. A lot of times they're just pieces moved around on a chessboard just to you know, give right. us excuses for the fist fights and car chases and explosions. Well, I'll tell you, one writer who does that, he does character development, and he does it in a similar way that I do, a lot of internal dialogue, mm-hmm. um, is Stephen King. However, he comes from a humanist worldview. Right. And he believes that if you solve a problem, it cannot be through a supernatural means unless, of course, it's the devil doing it. Mm-hmm. Which is a great big hole when uh-huh. it comes to King's supernatural fiction. Yeah. His because fiction is really good, except the only time <laughs> there is no God creator in it. If God is mentioned, it's some sort of divine watchmaker that just created the world and yeah. walked away. Or a cosmic chess player who uh, yeah. doesn't seem to have a problem with human suffering. As in the stand. It, it, my, yes, my point exactly. Mm-hmm. That's, that's a great, that's the perfect example right there. God's just playing chess with human lives. And that was a question that came up at the conference in San Antonio, a woman who came up to the table, uh, um, and I'm you were you, I'm, you weren't there, and I'm not sure why. Uh, you may have been uh, I may know, have resting, gone to the restroom. Going to the restroom or something, but anyway, she came up and she was weeping, and she had this question. And, and I bring this up because I think it's a question all of us as believers struggle with. God knows the end from the beginning. The Bible tells us that. So knowing the end and how this would all play out from the beginning, He knew Adam and Eve would sin. He knew that the angels would rebel that Satan would try to overthrow his authority, and that this conflict resulting from that rebellion would lead to sin, death, pain, sorrow, loss, agony. Why would a loving God allow that? Why would God create a world knowing that all of these problems would exist? Now, I didn't probe deeper because reading between the lines, I sensed that there was something going on in her life that was leading to this question. Mm-hmm. And all of us have things in our lives mm-hmm. that would lead us to question, If God, if you're really good, why would you allow X to happen to Y? Especially, say, if you're a parent with a, a child. Yeah, free 
will. Yeah. That's the answer to the question. God loves us so much, even the angels, that he created us all with free will. The only way to prevent people from doing bad things to other people or angels from doing bad things to people is to create us without free will, to create us as little robots, automatons, without the ability to choose. He didn't create us to be slaves, unable to do anything but love him. We can choose. That was for his pleasure. That's Now, a day is coming where there'll be a reckoning, and those who've chosen to rebel against him, knowing the consequences, because God has warned us, they will pay a price. Mm -hmm. But you know, you can also say that God created us knowing we would rebel, but also seeing the end, Mm -hmm. seeing that at the very end, we would all be with him at the throne. He he was he is creating a yes. a family who choose to love him. That is correct. So that's the answer and it's not an easy one when you're going through that wilderness journey when you're in the middle of that desert but when you get to the other side um uh, God will dry all tears and heal all wounds. Amen. So. Well, this sort of brings us into Genesis 11, where we, uh, we six weeks ago, we left off. Yes. Because it has to do with free will mm-hmm. and uh, choosing poorly. <laughs> so we'll recap the poor choice <laughs> right. the of tower, Nimrod and his buddies. Yes, the Tower of Babel incident, which was, uh, well, and we'll, we'll uh, get into that after we open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for bringing us back together again through this uh, electronic medium, and we pray, Father, for your spirit to to guide us and encourage us this week as we uh, dig into your word. Father, we pray for your blessing. We pray for understanding, to better understand your will through the study of your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Derek has a cold today, by the way. Yeah, if I sound a little raspy, it's not allergies this week. Um, brought something back from the coast. So we... Um, Hid in your suitcase. <laughs> it, it's like that little globby green thing in those uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, commercials. The mucus cold. commercials yeah, or right. whatever. Um, one of the aspects that we uh, haven't really touched on with the Tower of Babel, because it's not in the Bible. This, this comes through uh, additional research. By comparing... The story here with the uh, the poem Enmerkar and the Lord of Arata. Enmerkar is mentioned in the Sumerian king list. He's the second king of Uruk after the flood, because the Sumerians remember a day when the flood swept over. And this poem not only records Enmerkar wanting to, uh, and we, we talked about this six weeks ago, build up the temple to the god Enki at Eridu. Enki, the lord of the earth, uh, his temple the Eabsu House of the Abyss, mm-hmm. which in effect, and according to the poem, the point was to build it as a gleaming mountain, an abode of the gods. Building it as he was over what they believed was the abyss was his intent to spring the watchers, the titans, the Apkalu, out of the abyss. Mm-hmm. I think that is what they were trying to do. I think it was more than just, the Bible tells us they were trying to reach to heaven. Well, they, right. they knew they couldn't build it high enough to reach heaven. They were trying to create a false divine assembly, an infernal assembly. An artificial mountain. Exactly. Yeah. That is part of it, too. Uh, but I think there's something else that's part of it, too. Um, th- that, of course, was what prompted God to come down and, and stop it. Could Nimrod have actually done this? Don't know. Bible doesn't tell us. I'd find it hard to believe that a human could actually create a portal. Except that we are told, you know, that uh, nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Right, right. Which because might, they're all one people of one language of one mind. Yeah, which may imply something like that. Mm-hmm. But uh, again, it's not explicit, so we don't know. We can only speculate. But the other part of the speculation, when you look at that poem, Enricar and the Lord of Arata, is that um, his home city, Aruk, is known to have been the uh, patron city of the sky god Anu, who was the father of Enlil, who had become the chief god of the pantheon by the time of um, Enmerkar. Mm-hmm. Um, but Anu was replaced as the patron god of Uruk by Inanna, mm-hmm. Ishtar. And that was the doing of Enmerkar. Mm-hmm. The, ho- the, the broader... It's, it's almost like the, the rebuilding the abyss, the Eabsu for Enki was secondary in that poem. When you read the poem and a couple of others that have been attached to that uh, story, the conflict between Uruk and this neighboring country of Arata, where, which I, I tend to believe that it's in the north, it's Ararat. Oh, I think so too. Because building materials in southeastern Iraq, when you're looking for timber and jewels and things like that, 
uh, you know, bronze. There was none of that in, mm-hmm. in Sumer. It was just basically marshy and sandy. You had mud and fish and barley. And that but was it makes it. sense. I mean, Ararat, that whole region, that, that is like it's the birthplace of the, the second birthplace of mankind. Because that's where the, where, the ark where landed. Where the ark landed. Right. But also in that part of the world, you had um, access to minerals, metals, uh, bronze especially, which you needed for weapons, mm-hmm. timber mm-hmm. for building material. And so Uruk, according to archaeologists, for almost a thousand years, between roughly, roughly 4,000 and 3,000 BC, give or take, controlled the whole Fertile Crescent from Turkey down to the Persian Gulf. And so that city, and that was the that was Nimrod's kingdom. So Nimrod would have lived some time in that period of time, um, dominated that area so they could get the building materials they needed to build an empire. Mm-hmm. But Inanna, as you point out in your uh, presentations, and as uh, which has gone into our new book, Veneration, which will be out in just yeah, a couple weeks. Yeah, I have three weeks. chapters on her. Yeah. W- became the patron god or deity, I should say, because she's gender fluid. So calling her a god or goddess is not entirely accurate. She's both. Yeah. That also, I think, had something to do with the judgment against Nimrod. Now, the Bible doesn't say that in particular, but Nimrod's transgressions were... Well, let me put it this way. Nimrod's transgressions were more than just trying to build up the, the house of the abyss. Yeah, way more. Yeah. So uh, whether the Inanna thing had anything to do... But she is still very active in the world today. Just take a look around. Look at Hollywood. Look at the wars that are tr- pl- taking place around the world. What, something like 55 armed conflicts in the, on the world right now. She is the goddess of uh, ritual sex and gender fluidity. <laughs> Gender fluidity and war, mm-hmm. mindless violence. Mindless violence. In fact, in the uh, the ancient poems to her, she controls every aspect of civilization. Mm-hmm. I want to say one more thing before we go to Genesis eleven ten, and that is looking back at the language and nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. That's eleven six. I think we're going to see that same mindset again in the tribulation period. I believe that the Antichrist Mm -hmm. wants to try this again because he knows this verse too. And if he can get every man on board to worship him, get them all of one mind when they're chipped, Mm -hmm. then they will all essentially be automatons, all of one mind, a hive mind. We're already seeing that movement with the transhumanist movement, actually. Yes, we are. So I believe that the enemy is going to try this again. Yeah. I absolutely agree. So, well, let's uh, finish up with Genesis uh, 11. And if you're new to the Gilbert House Fellowship, by the way, you'll find uh, not only the uh, upcoming schedule at the website, gilberthouse.org. Don't forget, we've got a a free mobile app, so you can download these studies directly to your smartphone or tablet. Mm -hmm. Uh, It works for iOS devices and Android devices. We have a Facebook page where we we post things. Um, And by the way, in case you are new to this, we use the ESV the English Standard Version, and uh, we, we just, yeah, I just read it from blueletterbible.org. It's a great place to mm-hmm. get resources and to uh, read however you want to, but we also read very slowly. <laughs> we, we crawl through the scriptures. Right, right. So we dig through it with uh, a, a fine-tooth comb to try to pull more out, and um, that really is the only way to get more out of this. Our point is that you don't need to be a, a Ph.D., no. You don't have to have a doctorate in, in biblical studies or theology to do this. If you are a doctorate in biblical studies, you're probably going to find way more than we do. But we're, we're saying the average family can get together and do these Bible studies on your own. The tools mm-hmm. are there. Yes. So, um, Genesis, oh, and the uh, by the way, the order in which we read is chronological. So you'll notice that uh, on the upcoming schedule next week, we jump from Genesis 11 to Job chapter 1. Mm-hmm. Because in the history of the world, Job preceded Abraham. So mm-hmm. we'll jump to Job and then we'll go through the book of Job, which is going to oh, be really boy. a lot of fun because now we, we know a lot more than we did five years ago when we, we started do. this. We are really going to crawl yes, through Job Job's so got some slowly. deep stuff. So Genesis 11, beginning at verse 10. These are the generations of Shem. When Shem was 100 years old, he fathered Arpexad two years after the flood. And Shem... Oh, wait a minute. So he was 98... When the flood hit. Right. Mm-hmm. I never picture him being that old. But here's the thing. It took about 100 years for Noah to build the ark, mm-hmm. if I understand it correctly. From the time he's told to start building, about 100 years passed before Methuselah dies. Okay. 
So Shem is it, is it? Well, I think it's in there. But but anyway, Shem so so he was born, he knew nothing more other than his dad building an ark, is what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. That's probably right. Yeah, dad has always been building the ark. This is what dad does. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd have to do some some math on it. Again, six weeks retraining. <laughs> <laughs> and Shem lived after he fathered our and the ESV translated as Arpaxad, but some translations will write, write it as Arfaxad. Hmm. Different spellings, but uh, anyway. Uh, Arpaxad, uh, and Shem lived after he fathered Arpaxad 500 years and had other sons and daughters. Now, we don't know who those are and no, what people may have descended from. we're just following this line. Yes. When Arpaxad had lived 35 years, he, followed, he fathered Shelah. And when Arpaxad lived after he fathered Shelah 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Shelah had lived 30 years, he fathered Eber. And Shelah lived after he fathered Eber 403 years and had other sons and daughters. Now, Eber is probably the, uh, the ancestor, well, according to the Bible, is the ancestor of the Hebrew Yes, people. exactly. And this is a name that shows up in uh, the ancient world. There was a very popu- or popular, powerful... Popular band called Eber back in the <laughs> yeah. day. Um, a powerful vizier of the ancient kingdom of Ebla, which is located in northern Syria, in the region of Aleppo. He wasn't the king, but, um, and most, uh, I think, accounts, historians will use the name Ebrium, but it's essentially the same word, same name, Eber. And some have speculated that this Eber, who was the the vizier of uh, uh, of uh, Eb- uh, Ebla, mm-hmm. might have been an ancestor of Abraham. We don't know. But... Uh, yeah, it looks like the actual pronunciation is Ever. Ever, which makes sense. B in Semitic languages is, is vocalizes a yeah. V sound in English. So, and Shelah lived after he fathered Ever 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Ever had lived 34 years, he fathered Peleg. And Ever lived after he fathered Peleg 430 years and had other sons and daughters. Now, Peleg is interesting because... Um, we'll get to it. Yeah. Um, when Peleg had lived 30 years, he fathered Reu, R-E-U. I'm going to guess. And <laughs> Reu. And Peleg lived after he fathered Reu at 209 years and had other sons and daughters. I'd get it if I could get the connection to go through very quickly. For some reason, it just doesn't want to go through. Slow interwebs today, huh? Yeah. Mm. I think some of our other computers are hogging. Doing By the way, updates. it's important that you know the name Peleg mm-hmm. means division. Yes, and we will... We'll talk about that here before the uh, the close of today's uh, study. Uh, when Ru lived 32 years, he fathered Sarug. And Ru lived after he fathered Sarug 207 years and had other sons and daughters. When Sarug had lived 30 years, he fathered Nahor. And Sarug lived after he fathered Nahor 200 years and had other sons and daughters. When Nahor had lived 29 years, he fathered Terah. And Nahor lived after he fathered Terah 119 years and had other sons and daughters. Notice the uh, number of years is getting mm-hmm. r- r- lower and lower as the DNA becomes more and more corrupt. Right. By the way, it is Reu. Reu. Okay. Thank you. When Terah had lived 70 years, he fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And that is... Familiar names. Yeah, those are familiar names. We, we get down into... Uh, familiar territory here. Uh, verse 27. Now, these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. Now, let me... It just means the city of the Chaldeans. Right. And let me point out that the Chaldeans mentioned here, which would have been roughly, what, uh, Haran was uh, the the brother of Abraham. So this would be sometime around 2000 B.C. Mm Mm-hmm. These were not the Chaldeans of Nebuchadnezzar 1,500 years later. No. 1,400 years later. The Chaldeans were descendants of Amorites. But there was another group of people who lived in northern Mesopotamia called the Chaldeans or the Chaldees. They, they lived further north in the vicinity of what uh, was Ararat, or later the kingdom of Urartu. Mm-hmm. And this is one of the reasons, that plus the names of uh, Abraham's family, Terah, Abram, Nahor, Haran, uh, Nahor, Haran, uh, Terah, uh, even Sarug, names of people or names of uh, towns, Places, yeah, yeah, in what is now southern Turkey. So, Abram did not come from Ur 
in southeastern Iraq. No, no, I believe he came from Turkey. Yeah. The scholar Cyrus H. Gordon in the late 1950s wrote a paper on um, a, a city that is known from text, Amorite text, from the time of the, uh, the judges about a town called Ura, U-R-A, um, which was in Hittite-controlled territory. And the Hittites controlled basically the north of Mesopotamia all the way into and most of Turkey, what is now Turkey, complaining to the Hittite king about merchants from the city of Ura who were kind of overstepping the bounds of their authority in uh, their dealings with people in the king, within the kingdom of Ugarit. This is in northern Syria on the Mediterranean coast. So we know that there was a place where traveling merchants came from called Ura, and it is not unknown in the ancient world or even in today's world here in America where names will change through a process called ephesus where the final syllable is dropped or change somehow. So Ura very likely could be, and according to Gordon, probably was, and I agree with him, the Ur that's mentioned in the Bible here because you've got plenty of evidence here just in the names of Abram's family being named for towns that are in southern Turkey, or maybe the towns were named for them, Mm -hmm. although those towns are documented as existing long before Abram walked the earth. So probably the other way around. They were named for the towns in which they lived. What's also interesting here is in the Hebrew, it actually says Kazdi. Kazdi, right. The Kasidim. Mm -hmm. Again, translated as Chaldeans by... By the KJV and onward. Right. And that's probably because of the Masoretic texts. And that's because the uh, existence of these other people called the Chaldees or the Kasidim lost to history until archaeologists over the last 150 years have been digging things out of the ground in Turkey and found mm-hmm. these people. In fact, the chief god of these people living to the north, the uh, Chaldees, was named Kaldi. Yes. He loved coffee. <laughs> There's a coffee company, company we used to work for, in fact, owns uh, some, <laughs> owns radio stations in mid-Missouri, but they also own a coffee place called Caldi's Coffee. You can find them at the Schnook stores in St. Louis. Uh, really good coffee. Uh-huh. That was the best coffee in any radio station I'd ever worked for. Yes, yeah. it was. But um, Caldi, like Baal, Haddad, um, like Teshub or Tarhuns for the Hittites and Hurrians, Hurrians and Hittites, uh, Caldi was a, a storm god. Mm -hmm. And he was the chief god of their pantheon. Mm -hmm. So um, the Chaldeans in Genesis were not the Chaldeans of Nebuchadnezzar. That's the point. Those are to be located in southeastern Iraq because they invaded and took over and became the rulers of Babylon. Um, Again, they probably emerged from the Amorite tribes of Abraham's day, you know, over 1,400 years. The Chaldeans, if your Bible says Chaldeans or Chaldees, in Genesis, it's talking about people in the north in what is now Turkey, probably in the vicinity of Lake Van around mm-hmm. Urartu, because that's where these people were located. And Abraham came from the north. Look, if he was coming from Ur in southeastern Iraq and headed for Canaan, if Terra, that was his plan, he was way mistaken. Yes, Mrs. Gilbert, I see your hand up. I raised. have my hand up, Mr. Gilbert. Um, I was wondering, since this gets into Abraham and the whole story, mm-hmm. why don't we... Discuss more of what happened before verse 27 and begin with 1127 when we come back at the end of Job. That sounds like a good plan. Because I think reviewing this, talking about where he came from, is really important to Mm -hmm. what he ends up doing. I think that's a good plan. And that way we can discuss something that you and I are studying right now that is part of this whole division of the land. Going back to Peleg. Yes. Yeah. That is related to something we stumbled onto a couple of weeks ago as we're in the process now of editing our Israel tour video, which I pray that I'll have done this coming week. Yeah, which means we need that to send it off because it's part of these packages. Right. And, and uh, well, the books aren't there yet either. But still, paper shortage. Yeah. <laughs> we need to have it ready to ship in November. So I want to make sure that they're not waiting on me to finish uh, editing. No, but it's but, nearly done. And, and and by the time we send it off, it, it usually is about a five-day turnaround to get the discs back. Yeah, so. they're very quick. Yep. So the um, section of the video dealing with Gilgal Rephaim on the Golan Heights, that's that big maze, you know, five concentric rings, or four concentric rings around a central hub, which is a, uh, a tumulus which is a burial cairn mm-hmm. around probably a dolmen underneath all those pile, that yes, big pile of rocks. Probably. It's a big monumental 
site that uh, probably relates to the ancient cult of the ancestors. So I was looking for an overhead shot that I could do a screen capture from uh, Google Earth to show the direction from the, the two gates in Gilgal Rephaim. There's an entrance from the northeast and one to the southeast that appear to point toward extinct volcanoes on the horizon. There was a lot of volcanic activity in that part of the world back in the day, which is why they've got so much um, basalt on the uh, on the surface, a lot of volcanic rock. Mm-hmm. Well, as I pulled back in Google Earth, I, I noticed a very strange squiggly shape very near Gilgal Rephaim and immediately shouted, Sharon! <laughs> and brought the picture into you to show you. And, and I saw exactly what you'd seen. Yeah, it, it looks for all the world like a serpent-shaped mound mm-hmm. just to the north, literally a quarter of a mile from Gilgal Rephaim. Measuring it with Google's measurement tool on Google Maps, it's three quarters of a mile long, about 37, 3,800 feet long, which means it's more than three times longer than the Great Serpent Mound in Ohio. Mm-hmm. Would you say it was about 200 feet wide? It's about 200 feet wide. The Serpent Mound is pretty minuscule. It makes the Great Serpent Mound look like an earthworm. Yeah, it really does, because the Great Serpent Mound is anywhere from two to four feet tall. Mm-hmm. This one is 25 feet tall. Right. Not only that, when I went back to an academic paper that I'd read back in the spring before we visited Israel, because I wanted to be prepared to talk about it, I found a map of the area by an archaeologist who's done a lot of digs there in that area going back uh, 12 years and found, first of all, that these, that uh, Gilgal Rephaim is a lot older than what they had thought originally. They originally dated it to the Middle Bronze Age, which is about the time of Abraham, but when you push it back further, um, I mean, when you when you look at settlements on the Golan Heights close enough to Gilgal Rephaim for workmen to walk to work every day, you know, punch in and start moving rocks and then go home every night, the the, the Golan Heights was more or less uh, was very thinly populated in the in the Bronze Age because uh, it was very dry. Not mm-hmm. you, you, you couldn't farm there. You, you couldn't could, farm you there. Maybe raise cattle or or goats. But even too dry for that, apparently. Yeah, um, yeah. You had to go further back in history to the Chalcolithic period or the Copper Age. Uh, so they they anyway they they date the uh, the wheel to about four thousand BC, and they found that on this mound there were a number of Chalcolithic Age settlements there that are actually younger than the the wheel. But there are also more than 100 megalithic burials on top of the mound. For some reason, they're all um, just clustered right there on top of the mound on this map. And it's uh, clear that there was some sort of ritual aspect to this this site. We, we'd like to find out whether that mound is natural. Mm-hmm. This, the thinking is that it's a lava flow, but right. it's the only one in the region. So you have to wonder why there's just this one single lava flow that has a snaky appearance. Right. But why were all these cairns placed on top of it? That's exactly the qu- that's the question. So whether it's natural or not, the point is that was a site that was used for burials. A, sh- and- a site that the name of the site yes. means place of the serpent. This is in the middle of the old kingdom of Og of Bashan. And as Mike Heiser has pointed out, ding, ding, ding. That's the <laughs> weekly Heiser uh, reference. Finally. Yeah. In the Ugaritic tongue. Bashan would have been pronounced Bathan, and that literally means place of the serpent. So mm-hmm. we may have stumbled onto the reason that this area was called place of the serpent. Absolutely. And, and in fact, we're planning to go back to look at that specific formation right. and try to get uh, a local archaeologist to help us. Yeah. And we've got some drone footage from uh, Aaron Lipkin mm-hmm. that will be included in our upcoming video from Israel. But we want to go back. We want to do more uh, video right on top of the mound and look at those those uh, tombs and see if we can get a look at mm-hmm. uh, the sites where they've been digging. This this archaeologist who had been digging up there found one of the sites in particular had been ritually destroyed. It was a fairly large uh, multi-family complex, mm-hmm. but when it when it was done when, when the the p- inhabitants were done with it, they appear to have ritually broken all of their household goods, their utensils and stuff, like the bowls. They were making their bowls out of basalt, mm-hmm. you know, not clay. Well, you work with what you have. Yeah. Not much dirt there to make clay from. No. So they they broke their, their stuff, pushed in the walls of the house because of the, the presence of um, 
what appears to be, well, based on the evidence, it looks like they pushed in the walls, set the uh, thatched roof on, on fire, mm-hmm. and then filled the whole place with dirt. Right. They ritually buried it. Exactly. And that doesn't make sense if that's just, okay, we've decided we want to build a new house and we're going to move to another place where there's more water or whatever. Mm-hmm. No, they ritually buried it. Mm-hmm. And you see that, well, at Joshua's altar, where yes. uh, when the Israelites moved, apparently, from uh, Mount, uh, uh, Mount Eval to Shiloh, mm-hmm. they appear to have dismantled and ritually buried the altar there they so did. it wouldn't be desecrated. It's exactly. Now, why are we talking about this? Because in the days of Peleg, it's yes. possible that something happened that moved the earth, that, that plates were pulled apart, because his name means division. Mm-hmm. And we find out later that he was uh, born during the days when the earth was divided. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a rift called the Jordan Valley Rift that goes all through along the desert, the uh, uh, Dead Sea, and up along the uh, the Sea of Galilee, mm-hmm. and goes all the way up around Mount Hermon, and, and even far, a little farther. All, all the way up to northern Syria into Turkey. And down to Eilat. Mm-hmm. So it's a big rift that actually connects to the African plate. It's where yes. the African and the Arabian plates are, are pulling apart. Mm-hmm. We found out recently that there are megalithic burials all along that rift. That's really surprising. It, well, maybe not surprising is the right word, but it, it's interesting. Is it only because those are areas where they've got a lot of boulders? But where do the they surface? come from? They're not close enough to a volcano for the volcano to have hurled them out all in that one place. But if when the rift formed, mm-hmm. if boulders came flying out, right, then that's possible. Sure. But there are other places around the world where there's a lot of rock and a lot of stone. Yeah. I mean, in Scotland, for example, Cairn burials are not unknown. So No, that's true. But where did they come from? The, they don't I, just randomly appear. No. Uh, and, and the question is why that type of burial and why so many megalithic cemeteries along the both sides of the That's mainly the reason, the not side of the because rift. there's material, but because there's some sort of ritual reason, a religious reason, for building close to that rift, as if mm-hmm. it is the entrance to something. Yes. And that's going to be the subject, of, at least in part, of a book I want to work on for next year. I know, and we're yeah. not going to reveal too much, but what we're saying is there. we believe that there's a significance to that area, yeah. and it may be why things east of there are sort of realms of the dead. That was the area east of the Dead Sea mm-hmm. where um, Moses and the Israelites stopped at one place called Ovoth, which means mm-hmm. spirits of the dead, another place in the Exodus route called Aiha Avarim, which is ruins of the travelers, Mount mm-hmm. Nebo, the mountain of the Avarim, mountain of the travelers. Mm-hmm. Um, Bashan in that region was known to be the entrance to the netherworld. Mm-hmm. They had a couple of underworld deities or maybe one underworld deity by different names. Rapayu, king of eternity. Um, Molech was identified as being there at Ashtaroth, which mm-hmm. is not too far from the, the modern city of Dara, which is on the border between Syria and Jordan is the site of ancient Edrei. Um, and of course, Edrei and Ashtaroth were the two cities where Og ruled from in the book of Deuteronomy. Those are named specifically in the Ugaritic texts uh, uh, that uh, refer to uh, Rapayu. Mm-hmm. So this entrance to the netherworld there in Bashan, this the, the presence of all of these megalithic funerary monuments along the east side, especially along the east side of the Jordan Rift. Why all of that there? Again, it, does it remember something... That happened back in the day. The research that I've done into the uh, the old god Enlil, who was known by different names in the east of Mesopotamia, Enlil, Dagon in the center, El in the west, but then later known as Kronos and mm-hmm. Saturn and Baal Hamon, was king of the pantheon until he was replaced by the storm god. Storm god always replaces. Yeah. Uh, even Marduk, the city god of Babylon, had storm god attributes, even though he was not... Uh, technically the storm god when he first emerged on the scene but everywhere else you know baal zeus jupiter thor Mm -hmm. the storm god winds up on top and jesus in the new testament identifies the storm god baal as satan satan this old god was still worshipped i mean el still had uh his his followers uh in the uh the greek and roman worlds 
and the Phoenician world. When you get in, even as late as uh, in the first couple of centuries of the Christian era, there were still people who were sacrificing and often sacrificing children to Kronos and to Baal Haman. Um, even though the king of the pantheon was the storm god, Zeus or Jupiter uh, or Baal, this, uh, these, this old god, Baal Haman, Kronos, Saturn, was still being worshipped by the common people. Why is that? And I think you can make a good case that that old god, who's now in the abyss, if he was the king of the watchers, who mm-hmm. sinned and uh, in the Greek and Roman myths, confined to Tartarus, like the angels who kept not their first estate, that uh, Jude wrote about Jude and Peter. Uh, I, I think they're still influencing the world today, thinking that somehow they're going to get out. And maybe, maybe the, coming back now to the Tower of Babel, that was their... <laughs> Wondered when we were going to get there. <laughs> yeah. That was uh, their a- effort to try to convince Nimrod to bring him back under their influence. I think that's very possible. And while you were talking and, and explaining all of that, I was trying to look up Gobekli Tepe, which is supposed to be the right, oldest temple right. in the world, mm-hmm. and trying to find out where it was relative to the rift. Mm-hmm. And I haven't been able to find it uh, because well, I can't get it to connect very well. It's super slow. Don't worry about it. That, that's odd. because we'll, right. we'll find it. All I'm saying is that Gobekli Tepe, um, and it could be my machine is doing something else too, Gobekli Tepe is supposed to be the oldest temple in the world. Mm-hmm. The research that I've done into this old god, by the way, um, also known in um, what is now Turkey, uh, to the Hurrians and the Hittites as the god Kumarbi. Mm-hmm. And that's why I bring it up, because right. Gobekli Tepe is in Turkey. Yeah, and it, it points to that region along that. I'm looking at a map of the plate lines now, the Anatolian plate and the um, Arabian and African plates. Where um, th- that that is the region of the uh, the Amanus Mountains, mm-hmm. Mount Zephon, mm-hmm. which is yes, uh, extends up into Turkey, and I think Gobekli Tepe is in that region. But the earliest myths connected to this old god, uh, even among the Greeks and Romans, seem to suggest that he came from Anatolia. Kronos was not originally a Greek god; mm-hmm. exactly. he came from Anatolia, exactly. and the Anatolians, the Hurrians and Hittites, got him from Mesopotamia. Exactly. All of this goes back to the fact that we believe Abraham was called out of Turkey. Yeah. Right along. Yeah. Yeah. Look at that. There's there's the, the map there. Oh, yeah. Now, that's not showing a lot of detail, but yeah. we'll, we can get we'll a more have detailed to really, map. Yeah. Once I can actually get the internet to work yeah. quickly for me. You're hogging it all. <laughs> that's okay, honey. Um, but well, anyway, is- it, it I know that's a lot of information in a, just a, essentially hanging it on just a few verses. But... Boy, honey. But I think it's important to understand where we are now, because as it was in the then, we're going to see it again. Mm -hmm. As it was in the days of Noah, that's an important clue. Yes. To what we're about to encounter, what's going on now, why the world seems to be going to hell in a handbasket. What's interesting, and here's another reversal. We talked about this back when we um, looked at Genesis 8 and uh, brought this out onto uh, Unraveling Revelation. In Genesis 8, we're told that uh, the floodwaters receded for 150 days before the ark came to rest in the mountains of Ararat, mm-hmm. Urartu, Arata, northern, um, northeastern Turkey or Well, Armenia. they didn't recede for 150 days. It rained for 150 days. No, no. It said it, uh, I think it was receded for 150 days. I'll, I'll have to look that up. But I, I thought that was, huh, now I can't get, <laughs> I can't get mine up. But, uh, now I'm hogging it all. Um, Let's see. The fountains of the deep, this is back to Genesis 8-2. The fountains of the deep and the windows in the heavens were closed. The rain from the heavens was restrained, and the waters receded from the earth continuously. At the end of 150 days, the waters had abated. Oh, okay, you're right. And in the seventh right. month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. And okay, it, you're right. Just remember that uh, this uh, 17th day of the month coincides with the uh, third day of the uh, annual Feast of Tabernacles. Mm, that's interesting. Because it begins on the 15th of uh, Tishri. That's really yeah. interesting because tabernacles and end time eschatology, there's a lot there. Right. We, we don't have time to go into that. No, no. Um, so the 150 days of the waters abated and we connect that to the five months at the end when the uh, watchers, mm-hmm. the locust-like things coming out of the abyss, mm-hmm. have five months to torment people yeah. on earth. And my, my and, theory, and again, it's, it's a very speculative theory, is it may have taken 150 days for their children to die. Yes. 
And while the waters were abating for 150 days and they're waiting below the earth at the end, they come out for 150 days and uh, torment mankind. Mm -hmm. Um, Another reversal, just as the, the waters of the deep emerged, I think from, and again, this is speculation. Mm -hmm. Did the waters of the deep burst forth because of the force of having to thrust these very powerful supernatural entities into the abyss? Exactly. I think that's a very, very good question. And is it possible that Tartarau, that that word that says thrust down to Tartarus in uh, Second Peter, mm-hmm. that uh, that seems to imply some sort of force. It wasn't, oh, you know, just sort of flip them down. You You're just right. sort of gently so they drop. No, this seems to be forceful down to... And if if Tartarus is in the earth, or if there's an, uh, a door that mm-hmm. goes through the earth's mantle into another place mm-hmm. that is another dimension, it would leave a great scar upon the earth. Yes. And this is what we've been leading to through this whole thing. And is the scar the Jordan Rift Valley, Mm -hmm. which extends from Turkey in the north, which is where many of the earliest myths of this old god um, originate, all the way down to, I think, Madagascar. It's Mm -hmm. it's a a long, long uh, rift. Could that be? I mean, we we see when we went through Petra, when those rocks split, that it looked like they had been burned. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, we're exploring some other possibilities for Petra, but we'll talk about that some other time. But fascinating the the possibilities here um so yeah did the waters emerge because they were thrust down and then what kind of reversal would there be when they come back out at the end with those for those 150 days it is i mean we don't know we do we do see in in the bible in uh, the book of matthew it talks about the earthquake and the the when jesus is resurrected and the uh, veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom uh, but also we see the the, 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 that many of the saints, people who had died in the faith, had emerged from their graves and tombs and were walking around Jerusalem. Yes, as if the, the power that came off him sort of radiated throughout the area. David W. Lowe wrote an entire book on that called yes. Earthquake Resurrection, yes. which is fascinating. It's been out for a while now, 15 years, but yeah. it's still, if you don't Such have a copy a of that. a good book. Yeah, Earthquake Resurrection by David W. Lowe. Will that similar type of energy release take place. Well, let me tell you this. This morning, I decided, and we can end with this, I decided to take a look to see how often there are earthquakes along that rift. Mm -hmm. Every 90 years. Major earthquakes. Major earthquakes. There there have been a few timblers, you know, Mm -hmm. that are like two or three in that area. And they're not very often. It's like just like every 10 years or so. But every 90 years, there seems to be a big one, a seven or higher. Hmm. The last one was in 1927. Oh, so we're just about due. Mm-hmm. Prior to that, it was 1837. Yeah. And there's some big quake. In fact, there's one mention in the uh, the Old Testament, the earthquake in the days of, and I forget the name of the king, but yeah, it's uh, clear that uh, that's a very seismologically active area. That's one of the things that the scholars excavating the site of Tal El Hammam, the site of ancient Sodom, mm-hmm. looked at. Mm-hmm. And why they concluded that the destruction layer they'd found was not earthquake related was that the mud bricks didn't fall in all directions, which would happen if things were just shaking. They were all blown over mm-hmm. in the direction opposite the, of the Dead Sea, which is to the southwest. All the bricks had been blown off to the northeast. Right. But getting back to earthquakes, yeah. <laughs> there was one during the time of Jesus that's thought to have been along the rift. Mm-hmm. There was one. 90 years or so before, that Josephus refers to. So this idea of about every 90 years, that's an important one. We're due. Yes. We are due for another one. Nine, uh, 2017 should have been the when we had mark. one. Yeah. Well, pray for Israel and Jordan, because there are a lot more people living there now than there were 90 years ago. Exactly. In fact, one of the articles that I read said that the area just is not prepared for a major earthquake in that area. Uh, mm. the, the one in 1927 was in Jericho. Mm. Which is very close to Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. A lot of construction that's gone on there. A and lot the, of construction. And a lot of it is not up to earthquake standards. I mean, here in the United States, we've got certain standards for construction, especially in California. Mm-hmm. If the the threat of earthquake led to tougher standards for steel beams. This is something I had to learn when I was in the steel industry. Uh, they, they're more flexible than they used to be. 
that's not the case with a lot of the construction in uh, Israel because, well, all the time there's fights going on about uh, illegal construction here or there, and those things are not being done to any kind of code. And, and many of the buildings, especially over on the Jordan side, they are not completed. Because there's a rule that you pay your taxes once the building's complete. Mm-hmm. So you always leave the top floor. Exactly. Un- so yeah. it's it's hard to say how well um, fortified those buildings are if there were a major earthquake in anywhere nearby. So uh, pray for everybody there because the fact is we know from biz- biblical prophecy an earthquake will take place. And it will be the greatest the earth has ever known. Mm. And it may take place along the rift. Yeah. Hmm. Well, uh, we've got a lot... Uh, <laughs> A lot to think about uh, and a lot to uh, dig into as we, we go forward. Next week, we'll come back with uh, the book of Job and really get into that because a lot of layers of understanding are embedded in the book of Job. The divine counsel is very clearly shown in Job. Mm-hmm. We also see some historical references here and there. Uh, you might be surprised to know that the name Job is attested in extra biblical sources. The Egyptians knew of a ruler by the name of Job who, by the way, lived in Bashan, and he was connected to the uh, Anakim. Hmm, so lots coming up. Yeah, so we'll talk about that. Boy, we got a lot on the calendar already for next year. We do. We're all over the place next year. Speaking of catastrophic stuff, and by the way, I want to recommend a book. If you're really into a deep, uh, dense, fairly technical defense of a global biblical flood, uh, we were gifted a book, which I have just not had time to read, and it's it's denser than then I can really I'm totally comprehend. I'm going to try to read it over the next few months. Yeah. Dr. Andrew Snelling wrote this about five years ago called Earth's Catastrophic Past. It's a two-volume set, about 1,100 pages. He's with Answers in Genesis. We met him at the Ark Institute, or mm-hmm. the Ark Encounter back mm-hmm. in 2015. And uh, a friend of ours gave us the books, which I've kept on the shelf. And finally, it's it's relevant because... One of the things I... Well, relevant to us. Relevant to us, I should say. Not relevant to all of us. No, it's, yeah, relevant it's always to, relevant. It's always right. relevant. But relevant to research that I'm doing at the moment. Right. But anyway, the b- bottom line is, uh, did you take a look at that if you're interested in that kind of a real scientific uh, defense of a global biblical flood. But um, next year... Well, no, I guess I can't reveal that yet because they've not gone public with it. So we'll, no, we'll we hold can't. off on that. We'll just say that but, we're, we're doing a lot next year. The calendar yeah. is at gilberthouse.org. Yes. So if you're interested in going, we would love, love, love to meet you, especially those of you listening from the UK. We're going to be in Scotland in uh, the last weekend of April in mm-hmm. Troon. So mark that on your calendars because we would so love to have local people come and just learn from Billy Crone, Derek and myself. Um, Jim Barfield. S- Jim Barfield and Stephen Wright. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Copper Scroll Project uh, is is a fascinating investigation. So uh, if you're not familiar with it, take a look at his website, copperscrollproject.com, and uh, Jim Barfield will be there. Uh, again, we'll put all of these on the calendar at uh, gilberthouse.org. Yeah, but we have to tell you one more thing we're doing next year, and you've got to get the oh, ticket yes, now. Absolutely. And I mean now, put that in all caps with lots of exclamation points. No! Because... The Defender Conference 2020 is called Stand 2020, and one of the gentlemen who's going to be speaking, we just found out this morning, Governor Mike Huckabee. Yes. He not only will speak, he will also meet privately with anyone who is a Whispering Ponies Ranch sponsor or someone who is a, a, I can't remember what he calls them, but founder. The VIP uh, Founders Club. VIP Founders Club Mm -hmm. for the, the new studio. So if you want to know about that. Go to DefenderConference.com or call 844-750-4985. That is the studio uh, book line. You'll talk to one of the wonderful ladies or gentlemen there and ask about the Defender Conference. If you want to be a VIP or WPR sponsor, mm-hmm. ask them about that. Yeah, boy, that, that conference is going to be amazing. Besides and there's someone Mike else Huckabee, we're not allowed to tell you yet. Yeah, but we can tell you. Uh, Dr. Elvita King mm-hmm. will be there. Rabbi Jonathan Kahn uh-huh. will be there. Uh, Dr. Michael Heiser, mm-hmm. and of course, Yakubuyans, Yakubuyans, Carl Gallops, Lieutenant Colonel Bob McGinnis. Tom Horn will be speaking. This may be the last time he speaks at a conference, he says. He has told us this probably will be his last time. He's trying to do less and less because he's doing more and more on the ranch. Right. So uh, that's August 27th through 30th of 2020. And, uh, and by the way, he said the reason he is speaking at the conference next year is because the Lord has put a message on his heart that he knows has to be given next year, and he has to give it. Mm-hmm. it he's, it's one of those things where he is just, the Lord has spoken to him, so you, you, you will get to be hearing it if you are there 
in person. We will not stream this event. There will be DVDs afterwards, but no streaming video for next year's Defender Conference. So, uh, yeah, DefenderConference.com for more information. This week, the second of three weeks of broadcast on Skywatch TV about our new book, Veneration. Yeah, I know. We finally got our new uh, nonfiction book out. And there are two packages. One, you can get just book six of the Red Wing Saga, along with Veneration, and two wonderful gifts that are just thrown in. But you can also pay for all of the Red Wing Saga books. For a donation of $100, you're going to get all six books. You're going to get Veneration plus the two free uh, gifts. The reason it's $100 is because it's actually a donation to Whispering Ponies Ranch. Correct, yeah. So uh, you'll find out more about that at skywatchtv.com or skywatchtvstore.com. But, um, so essentially you donate $100 to Whispering Ponies Ranch and you get all these things. Right, yeah. Pretty sweet deal. Just in time for Christmas. That's right. Well, let's uh, close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for bringing us together this week. And uh, Lord, just pray for your your spirit to guide us. We, we pray for our our elected leaders of all political stripes, Father, knowing that uh, they are only in place, in position, because you have willed it so. We pray that your Spirit would guide them, grant them wisdom, and, Father, lead them to govern rather than to just play politics with one another. Um, Father, we we know that uh, what is happening is has been ordained, And we just pray for your spirit to remind us, Lord, that we are citizens of a higher kingdom Mm -hmm. and our first loyalty is to your realm, to you as our king and not to any nation. Lord, while we are here, help us to be salt and light to those around us in all realms, whether we are called to be active in politics or not, Father. Uh, You have not called us to withdraw from the world, but to influence the world by being salt and light. So help us, Lord, even with those who who may hate your name, Father, to show the love that you have shown us, that they might see in us the sacrificial love that you showed us on the cross. Knowing the end from the beginning, Father, you chose to sacrifice yourself for our sake anyway. Lord, may we keep that always in mind as we go through each day. We pray for your blessing, especially for those who are witnessing in in foreign lands, the missionaries who are taking the gospel, especially to places where your name, where your name is considered a curse. We pray for those in the churches in China, in the Middle East, and ask you to protect them and strengthen and encourage them, Father. And again, Lord, we ask for your soon return, and we look forward to it, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Until next time. I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We post a new Bible study each Sunday morning. Subscribe to the podcast and explore the archives online at gilberthouse.org.